The Irish Republic Army IRA, through its various incarnations, has been a central figure in the struggle for Irish independence from British rule. The organisation's origins can be traced back to the early 20th century, specifically in the formation of the Irish Volunteers in 1913. This group was instrumental in the Easter Rising of 1916, an armed insurrection aimed at ending British rule in Ireland. Despite the rebellion's failure, it significantly influenced the Irish national movement, leading to the War of Independence independence from 1919 to 1921. The signing of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921, which ended the War of Independence, led to the partition of Ireland and established the Irish Free State in the southern part of the island. However, the treaty was contentious and resulted in the Irish Civil War between pro-treaty forces who supported the Free State and anti-treaty forces who opposed the treaty on the grounds that it did not establish a fully independent island. The anti-treaty forces continued to use the name IRA. Over the following decades, the IRA attempted various military campaigns against the British presence in Northern Ireland, especially during the period known as the Troubles, from the late 1960s through to the late 1990s. This era was characterised by widespread violence involving the IRA, British security forces, loyalist paramilitaries and segments of the civilian population. The IRA's campaign involved bombings, assassinations and armed attacks targeting both military and civilian sites. The complexity of the IRA's history is further deepened by splits and factions within the organisation. The most notable split occurred in 1969, leading to the formation of the Provisional IRA, which became the dominant faction carrying out armed operations during the Troubles. Other fractions included the Official IRA, and later the Real IRA and Continuity IRA, each with its own ideological stances and objectives. The peace process of the 1990s, culminating in the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, marked a significant turning point. The agreement laid the groundwork for political power sharing in Northern Ireland and included provisions for disarmament of paramilitary groups, including the IRA. Following the agreement, the IRA announced the end of its armed campaign and began to process the decommissioning of weapons, signalling a move away from violence and towards political means to achieve its aims. The IRA's history is intertwined with a broader narrative of Ireland's struggle for self-determination and has been marked by significant debates, both within Ireland and internationally, about the legitimacy of the methods and objectives. The organisation's legacy is complex, reflecting the deep-seated issues surrounding national identity, colonialism and the quest for peace in a divided society. Tonight we'll show you how everyone in Britain is paying for terrorism in Northern Ireland. In Ulster today, taxpayers' money is being turned into bullets and bombs that kill the committed and the innocent alike. We're on our way to a lonely and dangerous meeting in Northern Ireland. A demonstration that it's naive and idealistic to think that the funding of terrorism comes largely from collecting boxes in sympathetic pubs and friends in America. To get the evidence, we posed as English property developers and staged a sting on a big-time paramilitary extortionist. Ah, um, yes, oh, yes. all right. Which one of you is Mr. Davis? I'm you said you were going to come on your own? Yeah, but, uh, 
We're the same worry as you, huh? You're quite safe. The man who turned up in that Craig Avon car park is in fact Eddie Sayers, a prominent member of a legal organization, the Loyalist Ulster Defence Association. He's the man on the right at this recent UDA press conference. They are unrecognizable as terrorists as we used to think of them and are now very much more a mafia type operation. The terrorists have developed a very significant financial infrastructure that makes them self-supporting, that gives them a very uh, sophisticated base that allows them uh, to employ thousands of people to turn over millions of pounds a year. It's estimated that the total income that's going into the coffers of the gangsters is in the region of 15 million pounds a year, which is going to buy the bullets and the bombs which, that are used to kill the British soldiers who are over here. Not only does the British taxpayer pay a million a day for the RUC and on top of that the British Army, but they're also actually paying for the bullets and the bombs that are used to kill the people who are sent over here to defend Northern Ireland. These days, most of Belfast looks like any other modern, bustling city. But beneath the surface, there's a subculture reminiscent of the Mafia in the 1920s. Paramilitaries on both sides of the divide, both Loyalist and Republican, have become racketeers. Extortion, contract killings, blackmail, forgery, gaming machines, bank robberies, smuggling and kidnapping. You name it, they are doing it. A bullet costs roughly 30 pence, but the real cost of the logistical support for each paramilitary bullet fired in anger in Ulster is approximately 100,000 pounds. A number of very brave people have risked their lives to take part in this program. Some of them, like this former builder, have asked that their appearance and their voices be disguised. With this building contract in the shackle, and uh, after being there for about two, two to three weeks, I got a phone call from the foreman to call and meet two men that wanted to see me on the site regarding security. But I was advised that it would be with my best interest to go. So I went round with the two men to Newmont Securities, which was upstairs in a fairly run-down premises. Sit down. Do you know why you've been brought here? No. We control this area. You don't build anything. They asked me for £5,000 down, plus £150 a week, which I refused to pay. And I told them that I might as well pull off the site now rather than continue with it. So after a long discussion, they forgot about the 5000 and they asked me for, originally it was, it was £90 per week, which I agreed to pay. For that, they were giving me complete protection. No trouble, no trouble at all. No shake on it, that. The deal, which was soon to turn sour, was struck in an office at the UDA's local headquarters in the Shankill Road, from which Newman Securities is controlled and run. After about two months on the site, then this went up to £110 per week. We were paying maybe eight to ten thousand pounds on that site the length of time we're on it. And we would have lost some of the reason I think it was thirty four thousand pounds of the materials during the period we were on it. And then one of the workmen was shot. He was leaving the site as usual and uh, he was coming out to the small side gate. There was two men standing, as he brushed past them, they pulled out a, a bomb and they shot him on the head. He was taken then to the hospital, he died in about three or four days after that. He couldn't get anyone to work for him anymore and his business collapsed. He lost everything. These cheques represent the payoffs made to the UDA over a period of eight months by just one building firm. There are many, many more. Well, over a number of years, um, <clears throat> I paid an awful lot of money to the paramilitaries. Uh, I was pressurized on virtually every building site that I ever did work on, and uh, always had to pay. There was no way of getting out of, out of it, and uh, also, my life, life was threatened as well on occasions. 
What sort of money have you coughed up over the years, do you think? We're on in the Soren region of £30,000. And did you ever try not to pay? I did, yes. With what result? With the uh, threats in my life. These people come on the site and make their demands on site. Now, it may be a very friendly first meeting uh, and the pressures don't seem very great. Uh, but if you know, for instance, that the day prior that some building contractor has been shot and the racketeers arrive with you next day, you don't need a crossword said to you. You know what they mean. Uh, but sometimes, perhaps, a contractor will be taken into a, a local club and uh, he will have a barrel of a gun stuck three inches down his throat and they will explain to him the merits of having a private security firm operated by the paramilitaries uh, look after his particular business and you may still find not a crossword spoken. Councillor Brian Feeney says the grip of the terrorists is now almost unbreakable. The control that these people have on everyday lives of ordinary people is the most serious problem because to deal with it you're going to have to confront the fact that anyone who gives information will be killed. It's as simple as that. One of those who paid the ultimate price was the Reverend Robert Bradford, the Westminster MP for South Belfast, whose widow Nora says he was preparing to expose Republican racketeering before his murder in 1981. He lived under a continual threat. In the last, I suppose, six months, we had um, reports of, of threats every week at least, if not a couple of times a week. And he uh, had decided that the best way to get up the terrorist organizations was to get up the funding. He felt that the only way to undermine that type of, of organization was to stop the funds. So he had worked on that avenue for quite a while, for really a couple of years before he died. He felt that um, there was an awful lot of money coming through Belfast and through the uh, bandit machines, through different mafia-style organisations. The cost to both sides of running paramilitary activities totals £15 million a year. £13 million comes from sources like the building industry, drinking clubs and black taxis. The taxis began in the early 70s when there was consistent civil turmoil which meant that buses were being hijacked or stoned or burnt and people couldn't get up from the centre of Belfast. Men then started taxiing up and down the Falls Road, taking their own routes through back streets and avoiding the, the turmoil on the, the front of the road. Once again the IRA took over the taxis and exact a weekly toll from the, the drivers. Pretty soon they found they were making so much money out of running the taxis that when normality began to return and buses started to run again on the Falls Road, uh, people burnt the buses and hijacked them, and it was impossible for the buses to compete. The black taxis largely operate through two associations controlled by the paramilitaries, the Republicans on the Falls Road and the Loyalists on the Shankill. A campaign of bombing pubs and hotels led to a situation where the Conway Street Mill officers of the Association of Drinking Clubs now control scores of seemingly shabby but highly profitable drinking clubs like this one in the Ardoin. At the moment it grosses over £90,000 a year. In there? In there. It never had planning permission. The police never objected to it. Now it is the full paraphernalia of surveillance cameras. This road had to be bent round, curved. The idea was to demolish this place and drive straight through. But the DOE and the housing executive couldn't do that because they were afraid of the people who control this club. Uh, Shows what power they've got. That's right. Um, they dominate this area. And most of the money that's taken in this club, that's profit, um, goes to the support of the IRA. On the skyline of Belfast stands the City Hospital, a monument to paramilitary profiteering from the building industry. It should have cost £9 million, but actually cost 65 Paying off the boys is an established practice. The vast bulk of uh, the building industry in Northern Ireland depends on government or public authorities, and consequently built into every contract is the amount of money uh, going to the paramilitaries, and that's coming directly from the British government and from the British taxpayer. 
In an effort to erase some of the worst housing conditions in Europe, the government spends 475 million every year. So much of the money was going astray that four years ago, the Northern Ireland housing executive called a secret meeting at its headquarters. We were very conscious of the threat to the whole future of the housing effort in Northern Ireland from paramilitaries. We're being trusted with very large and increasing sums of money. Clearly, if money was being seen to be being misdirected, not simply being, being, being defrauded, but being used to buy bullets and, and, and guns and bombs, then the British public was going to take a poor view of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive, and thus our future really depended on, on doing what we could to rid the housing market here in Northern Ireland of this threat. But what they did do was too little, too late, according to Robert McEwen, the former Republican mastermind of the biggest building industry fraud so far. He managed to exploit a government tax exemption scheme to allow building contractors to delay paying their tax. When payday came, the Republican front companies had disappeared. We tracked him down in hiding and persuaded him to explain for the first and only time how the fraud worked. False companies were set, set up and they were issued with authentic inland revenue documents, tax certificates, and these were produced to the building contractors and they were told to accept them and to take them, even though they knew who they were for. And payments were made each week on that, anything from five, ten thousand pounds. And when you added all that up over a period of a year, what sort of money are we talking about? Well, I couldn't give you a total figure, but I've heard that it was about five million pounds. This little plastic card is the key to the paramilitary's biggest money-making scheme. And it was years before the authorities and the police realized just how sophisticated and how vast the scam really was. It all began here on the terraces at Aston Villa football ground during a home match when little cards like this and certificates like these were given to an IRA man in return for £10,000. The money to buy the documents needed to make the fraud work was sent from Belfast to this bank in Birmingham and in November 1983 paid into the account of the then manager of the Victoria pub in Balsall Heath. This money obviously must be laundered and they have legitimate businesses, they have legitimate accountants, chartered accountants, solicitors to advise them. The police have begun to crack down on fraudsters and the government proposes new legislation to introduce tighter controls. So far, most new efforts have been sidestepped by the paramilitaries. So will the new measures work any better? I don't think so. Certainly they had success within it, but people altered and changed the system to suit themselves. They dug in deeper and they enforced more secrecy among the contractors to ensure that the flow of information wasn't going back to the police. Is there any comparison you could make that the rest of us would understand as to how the, the scene operates in well, Northern Ireland I, now? I suppose that the one comparison that would come to mind would be uh, America in the 1920s and the 30s when the Mafia was in its infancy. And look how sophisticated they became. Of course, there was no political philosophy involved with the Mafia. It was purely rackets and finance. But that seems to be the trend with the paramilitaries especially the INLA, UDA, the Provos. I think they are into top gear now and with sophistication. The money doesn't only go to finance terrorism. With the loyalists especially, greed has overtaken politics and a large percentage of the takings ends up in criminals' back pockets. A major source of income for the loyalists is the bogus security firm. We telephoned one such firm posing as English property developers about to win a big contract. Hello? Uh, Rogers. Hello, uh, my name's John Davis. Uh, Mr. Graham. Yes, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry I wasn't here when you called before. That's okay. We traced the firm, Borderline Securities, to a farm near the border in Omar. Well, you understand the score then? I do. Well, as you know, my name's John Davis. I'm yeah. a 
Exactly me, you will be dealing with. That is my area. Okay. Okay, then. I'll tell you what, I'll meet you tomorrow, wherever you want, at whatever time you want. And I wouldn't mention it to anybody else, you know. A meeting was arranged for the next day in a deserted car park near the proposed building site. I don't actually know who I, you are. I'm Sayers. Mr. Sayers? Yes. That's my right name, do I? Mm. So I don't want you to quote me, please. Uh, we work for an organization. Mm. Right? And uh, you, you better tell me, if you can, who you're, which organization you're working for. You do. Eddie Sayers, on the right, is important enough within the UDA to appear at a major press conference. He's with two of the top men, John McMichael on the left and Tucker Little in the middle. What sort of money is involved? Well, it could be as much as about three and a quarter million. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, end, the amount that we would be hoping to, to get from you would be uh, seven, nine thousand per million. Nine thousand per million. No, we're prepared to work with you. You haven't got the contract. And what we would say to you is, uh, don't last the contract, if you can get it. Ooh. Because we prefer, say somebody else comes on here, Ooh. and we've got to go hassling them. Ooh. It means hassle for us, and we prefer not to have that. You're not saying you're giving me a discount, are you? Yes. Yes. Oh, that's what it means to. That's what it means to. No, but we work with you. But you, you please tell me what I get for this. What do you want for it? Well, what, what do we get for it? Most of them get nothing. Only we make sure there's no hassle Ooh. from our anybody that we can. Ooh. And if they are getting hassle, well, we'll call on the ones that's given them the hassle. It's as Ooh. simple as that. Why do we have to pay anything at all? What happens if we don't, in other words? We couldn't answer that. Uh, yesterday, at the time you were sort of ringing us, uh, they were putting a firm off a site. Purely and simply because he wouldn't cooperate. It's as simple as that. And so that's one of the things that could happen to us if we don't. We wouldn't... We You wouldn't work. We wouldn't work. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sayers came armed with a calculator and, no doubt, a gun. Death threats followed his discovery that we'd rumbled him and knew that Borderline Securities was run from his Omar home. The nerve centre of the Loyalist protection rackets is here at UDA headquarters in Gorn Street, Belfast. The UDA's extortion specialist is Jimmy Craig. We filmed him in the peaceful surroundings of the wedding of his minder, Artie Fee. Craig's many critics paint a very different picture. There's one pair of men who would come on the site and uh, that's the well-known Jimmy and Artie. They would tell you, you know, we shoot pouts. And you say, what do you mean by that? If you're thinking of going to court or anything like that, or talking to the police, you'll be shot. When they come on the site, the men know them very well, and they are a frightening pair. They have a, an atmosphere about them and a way of going that is a threat in itself. The men do get frightened with this, of course. And I'll say to them, these men are after money, not blood. But if the truth be known, they have to have a bit of blood now and again to get the message through. Jimmy Craig came on the site with a couple of his pals um, on one occasion and uh, actually produced a gun and said that if uh, we didn't pay up, that he would use it and that he had used it in the past. And of course you then paid. I did, think. yeah. Twenty major building firms have admitted to us on a confidential basis that they all paid Craig and his loyalist cronies amounts ranging from hundreds to tens of thousands of pounds. To these businessmen, Craig's message was all too plain. Talk generally about how many murders they were wanted for, just to get the message over. It sounds a bit like a joke, but it's not. Well, Craig is vicious. He's been known as the hard man of the Shankle Road. He looks a hard type of man. When you meet that type of guy, you know that he's vicious, ruthless, and will stop at nothing including involvement in murder, according to those convicted of the killing of Mary Blake's son, Paul, who was gunned down in the street near his home. Well, I was just happened to be coming on the road at the same time. Well, I knew then, when I seen that he was dead, because there was so much blood all over his chest. It was brought out in court that Jim Craig paid them £2.7 after the shooting. Was this 
allegation made in open court. It was court. made in open court. That's about so my son's life was worth nine pounds. The two fellas got life. Craig, who'd already served a prison sentence for extortion, was back in court for what became known as the Hooded Witnesses trial. He stood accused of operating a protection racket on the building sites, but the witnesses were so frightened they would only appear in balaclavas and hoods, and on this basis their evidence was ruled inadmissible and the case collapsed. Jimmy Craig, his minder, Artie Fee, and another cohort were jubilant as they ripped up the charges. Obviously we're elated to be released, but we're very embittered of having to spend six months in custody, separated from our wives and family, on such fictitious charges. Not only were the charges fictitious, the witnesses were also fictitious. When they were, they were nameless, hooded men were brought into court of law, never, never before known. And British, uh, justice and British Looking for justice is Barbara McCullough, whose husband Bucky was the finance officer of the Loyalist UDA and Craig's one-time best friend. Bucky and Jimmy have been friends for a lot of years. We all went out together and went on holidays together. And the last time Jimmy was in jail, there'd been a meeting and Bucky had had discovered that there was money going the wrong way. And Bucky went up that Monday to confront Jimmy with it. And he told him that when he got out, he was to be off the road. Well then, Friday morning, Bucky was murdered. And it was Melch UDA contracting the INLA. So two mortal enemies actually yes. cooperated to yes. kill your husband? Yes. Is there cooperation between people on either side of the political divide? Yes, very divvying much up? so. Very much so, especially among the INLA and the UDA. It is. It does seem to be a formal and ongoing arrangement. Uh, you can go to certain bars in Belfast and you can see people drinking together. Obviously, there's agreement on particular sites about who shall operate which racket, and uh, there generally is little competition between uh, the paramilitary organisations on both sides within the same field of operation. That's why you find the building industry uh, almost dominated by the loyalist paramilitaries and certain other rackets almost entirely dominated by the republican paramilitaries. The INLA had two men that were operating for them, McKeown and Maxwell. They were the two big men, two big operators, and they worked with the UDA, carving up building sites and splitting the profits. It seems extraordinary that sworn political enemies should actually be working together. Makes you think the politics comes second. Yes, the trend seems to be that way, that it, the criminal elements are taken over and the political philosophy is taking a back seat. If the troubles, as they are colloquially called in Northern Ireland, ever cease, the ever-ending problem that we are going to have is a well-organized entrenched protection system it's the paramilitaries now who call the tune and the politicians bend to the paramilitaries and if they don't get a grip of the situation how far might it spread well it's quite possible that it will spread to the mainland mainland britain i don't believe that it's politics i believe it is pure gangsterism The history of the Irish Republican Army, IRA, encapsulates the century-long struggle for Irish nationalism and independence, marked by a series of violent and non-violent efforts, internal splits and political negotiations. 
from its early 20th century roots in the Issa Rising through to the turbulent period of the Troubles to the eventual peace process leading to the Good Friday Agreement. The IRA's activities have been central to the narrative of Irish-British relations. The organisation's evolution from armed insurrection to participating in peace processes underscores a broader shift towards seeking political solutions to deeply entrenched conflicts. This history raises important questions about the nature of resistant movements and the challenges of transitioning from armed struggle to political engagement. It also prompts reflection on how societies can reconcile after prolonged periods of conflict addressing issues of justice, memory and reconciliation. How do the actions of the IRA during the Troubles compare to other nationalist movements globally? What lessons can be learned from the peace process in Northern Ireland that might apply to other regions experiencing sectarian or nationalist conflicts? In what way have former combatants been integrated into political processes? And what challenges does this pose for post-conflict societies? How does the legacy of the IRA influence contemporary Irish politics and society, particularly in Northern Ireland? Exploring these questions can provide deeper insights into not only the history of the IRA, but also the broader dynamics of conflicts and peacebuilding in divided societies.